Hello everyone and welcome to My name is Matthew Carhill. My name is Miles Muir. And we're coming live from here at the Queen's House in Greenwich. The Queen's House uh, has been a royal resident, uh, it's been an artist studio, and now it's a beautiful art gallery uh, at the heart of Greenwich. And tonight we're going to introduce you to two fantastic artists, Willem van Velde the Younger and his father, Willem van Velde the Elder. In the, green, uh, in the Queen's house in Greenwich in the 17th century. Uh, we're going to talk about their work and their legacy uh, and also share with you the story of two really amazing conservation projects that we've been working on over the last two years. And to make tonight a bit more interesting just, than just us two uh, chatting away, no, uh, we have got three amazing guests to help us out and they are Imogen, um, Ted Bree, and um, who are you and how are you going to help us tonight? <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, I'm Imogen Tedbury. I'm the curator of art before 1800 here at the Queen's House, and I look after the Vandervelders in our collection. And next to Imogen, we have Maya Wassel Smith. Um, what do you do? Uh, I'm the lead researcher on the Solbay Tapestry Project, so I can fill you in on some of the history, hopefully. Fantastic. And last but not least, we have Miranda Brain, who's got some interesting objects in her hand, but Stay tuned to find out what they are. What do you do? So I'm Miranda and I'm painting conservator here at Royal Museums Greenwich and I'm the lead conservator on the conservation project of Willem van der Velde the Younger's Royal Visit to the Fleet. Fantastic. Great, so I guess the reason we're here tonight is to talk about the van der Velde's, but um, I guess to get down to the bottom of it, who, who are they and why are they so important to, to Greenwich? Um, so the Van der Velders were probably the most famous marine artists of the 17th century, and they were extremely famous in the centuries afterwards as well. Um, born in the Dutch Republic, as um, the region that we call the Netherlands um, today was then known, um, they worked together in their studio in Amsterdam. Uh, Willem van der Velde the Elder was a draftsman, um, so he went out uh, in a small boat with the Dutch fleet. He would... Um, he would draw naval action and battles as they took place um, in this tiny boat um, alongside the action um, on these very, very long sheets of paper compiled from a number of different pieces, all patched together, um, which he would then work up in his studio when he got home and use this as a source for um, some extremely impressive paintings that were um, requested and commissioned by uh, patrons across Europe, um, from Britain and Norway to Italy. Um, his son, Van der Velde the Younger, wasn't so much a draftsman, although he did do drawings himself, but he was rather a painter, trained in the studio of one of the leading um, marine painters of the day, and he produced um, some fantastic works in his lifetime in the Dutch Republic and also here in England, and we're lucky enough to be sitting in a room we call the Van der Velde Studio, which contains a number of his greatest works from our collection. Fantastic. <coughs> um, you sort of touched on uh, the idea of him as a marine artist, uh, both of them. Um, can you just give us a little bit more background about the importance of marine art during that time? Sure, of course. So the 17th century is really um, the beginning of Britain as a naval force in the world. And for the Stuart kings, that is Charles II and James II, um, their navy was really a symbol of their power on the world stage. This is a time not only of um, increasing naval warfare, but also um, the expansion of the British Empire and the Dutch Empire um, across the seas as well. And a number of the battles that took place that the Van of elders are commemorating um, are, are essentially trade wars as, as these powers are competing to gain further wealth which they are doing um, through their ships. Um, and the ships that the Van der Velders are painting are not just very practical, very speedy vessels, the kind of latest in maritime technology. They are also works of beauty and of craft in themselves, um, beautifully carved, often highly decorated and gilded. Um, these ships are all individual works of art in themselves, and the people who sailed them, the captains and the admirals uh, and the kings, really um, love to have these, these records of the beauty of these um, monumental craft that were carrying them around the world and bringing their kind of goods back to England. Um, the Van der Velders were painting these ships 
Ship models were another um, three-dimensional way of capturing these incredible objects, and we have a number of fabulous ship models here at the Queen's House, um, which sort of sit alongside our Van der Velders. Um, but, but essentially, marine painting um, took on the weight um, of, a kind of, of a kind of portraiture of, of, a, of a dynasty, if you like. Um, we can think of the Van der Velders painting the Stuart ships uh, in the same way that Anthony van Dyck was painting uh, the children of Charles I, the kind of generation before. Um, these, these paintings are symbolic of the kind of British empire and British power in the world. Fantastic. Um, so you've talked a lot about them as sort of Dutch artists. They're Dutch. Why are they here in Greenwich? Why are they here in Queen's <laughs> House? Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, it's a great question. So in 1672, um, there was um, a year of incredible financial crisis in the Dutch Republic. Um, uh, the Dutch still today call it the romp -yar, um, this sort of time of, of terrible crisis. Um, and uh, during that time of crisis, the paintings trade um, really went downhill as well. It was a year of personal tragedy as well for the Van der Velders, father and son. Um, Van der Velder, the youngest brother, Adrian, died that year. And in this moment, uh, Charles II, King of England and Scotland, um, set out an open invitation to all Dutch artists and artisans that if they wanted to come over to England, he would pay them, they would um, have tax incentives, they could settle here and be recognised for their skills um, here in England. And this is what the Van der Velders did. They came over um, in the winter of 1672-1673, so nearly 350 years ago, um, and they settled here in London. And we know that Charles II gave gave them studio space here at the Queen's House um, where they worked for some 20 years and produced and conceived uh, many of the masterpieces that we'll be talking about um, this evening. Fantastic. It's really interesting. Thank you for that. So, um, yeah, in talking about some of the conservation projects that we were doing over the last uh, couple of years, uh, one of them was uh, a painting by Willem van der Velde the Younger called A Royal Visit to the Fleet and the Thames Estuary. And we, on top of conserving the painting, had a really fantastic uh, public engagement uh, program around that that Matt was leading up on. Um, it would be great if you could tell us a little bit more about some of the projects that came off the back of that. Yeah, so at Royal Museums Greenwich, it's not just about the artwork, it's about the social purpose behind the artwork. And it's not always just telling the stories about the artist, it's it's the skills the conservators have. And back um, last year, and coming into this year as well, we worked with a group from the Royal Borough of Greenwich, a group of young people who helped us out investigate the different skills which, which were being used through the conservation process. And the video which we're gonna show you next involves this young group of amazing young people who have gone on since to produced some fun, fantastic things and they've made these nine videos. You're going to see one which is all about colour matching and how, how our conservators do colour matching. And in the video you'll see our conservators show the skill but also for our young people to have a little taster as well. So I really hope you enjoy this video. Sarah has been retouching the visit to the Royal Fleet. With retouching, there is a very fine line between restoration and concealing the original. The paint that is added has to be as minimal as possible. You know, if someone comes along in 50 years' time and goes, God, what did she do? <laughs> like, you know, that's not good, that's not how we want it. But if we shine a uni light on it, do you see where it looks dark? Yeah. Working with a little bit closer. So that's all the spots that I put paint on. I'll open one which isn't too toxic, I'll show you. Um, so it's just a powder. And what we do is we mix that with a medium. The medium we're using, so this is like one of our varnishes, it's called Lower Pal A81. Um, and what it is, is it's a synthetic resin mixed with um, solvent. 
So these are kind of magnifying glasses, and they make your eyes look hilarious. They're all subtly different, and that's because they're from subtly different sources. Six colours. Have a go. Try and figure out which colours. We started by just trying to match colours, which is tricky enough. We had these replicas of the painting and tried to retouch the damaged areas. A lot of the damage on the visit to the Royal Fleet is from overcleaning by previous conservators. Sarah has to add pinpricks of paint millimetre by millimetre throughout the entire painting, which is three metres wide. The level of precision and focus for so many hours is astounding. Hello and welcome back to Van der Velde live here in the Queen's house. That last video just gave you, opened a tiny bit of a door to conservation and how we look after the paintings here. But we've got Miles here who's, who's oh well, one of our... <laughs> Involved in the conservation, yeah, but, so. but, but not as much as Miranda, who um, I want to talk to you but more specifically about uh, the conservation that was put into a royal visit to the fleet. Um, so obviously it, it's gone over a series of years. It started, I think, in late 2019 yep. um, and is still ongoing at the moment. Um, but I've got some questions for you about some specifics about what you've been doing with painting. Um, so like, first and foremost, why this painting? Why did it need conservation? Why did we start work on it? Well, um, as Imogen said, it's a very important painting to our collection. We think it may very well have been painted in this exact room, although we can't say that for certain. We think it's highly likely it was. And unfortunately, as paintings age, um, they can deteriorate. And this painting in particular is a very large painting, and it had a glue paste lining, which over time has degraded. And um, the role of the lining is to support the original canvas and unfortunately it was no longer doing this, meaning that the painting was unstable. Um, it also was flaking, which is obviously not great, um, so it was quite an urgent, urgent job that we needed to conserve the painting. It was also coated in a varnish, and as it was natural resin, over the years uh, it has oxidised and aged and become very yellow, meaning that the original colours that the Van der Velders used were no longer able to be appreciated, and um, it also made the painting look very flat. Um, so we decided to um, embark on this conservation project primarily to stabilise the painting, but also to try and return it to um, the glorious painting that Willem van der Velde the Younger intended. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the specifics, I think particularly with the, the, some of the structural um, elements yeah. that, that needed work on? Um, can you go a little bit more into detail about those? Yeah, definitely. So um, the first treatment that we undertook on the painting was the consolidation. With a painting, the paint layers are obviously the most important thing because it's what what shows what the painting is. Um, so there, it was quite a long process of consolidating those paint flakes um, and stabilising the painting that way before we undertook a surface clean to remove all, a lot of the dust and grime that had accumulated on the surface over the years. We then undertook a varnish removal to remove that really yellow oxidised layer and um, reveal the beautiful colours that Van der Velde painted. But one of the most, um, the kind of longest treatments was the structural, structural stabilisation of the canvas. Being such a big painting, it's quite a weighty painting, so it was important that the canvas was able to support those paint layers. Um, so we firstly had to deline the painting, which involved removing that um, lining canvas. And it's quite a difficult job. It takes a lot of expertise and is quite painstaking. Um, and we then had to remove a lot of the excess adhesive that remained on the back of the original before we could then reline the painting and ensure that it was structurally stable for years to come. 
Um, the stage that we're on at the moment, which is one of the stages that was part of the Conservation in Action, which pe people were able to come and see in October, was the retouching stage. And this is the point where we're bringing the painting together and it will be able to be enjoyed for exactly how Van der Velde, the younger, intended it. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Part of that stage, we, we opened up to the public to ask some questions, didn't we? Milo, you've got a few in front of you, see? I do, yeah. It was, we had a really good response to people coming through and seeing Miranda working on the painting. Um, and we had some really great questions um, from people throughout those six weeks. So I've got a few to put you, put you on the spot, so we'll see if you can, you can nail them down. So I guess um, the first question is, what is the main difference between an artist and conservator? Because it seems that there's a lot of, sort of crossover skills involved. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when we were retouching, I think you could definitely see the similarities. Um, when I'm sitting in front of an easel with my paintbrush and my palette, I very much look like an artist. Um, it Also, one of the crossovers is, as a conservator, you have to have a good knowledge of how a painting is constructed, so how an artist would have gone about painting the painting that you can see. So that's everything from the support, whether that's a canvas or a panel, to the preparation of the ground layers, to how they would have prepared their paints and the pigments that they would have used. Um, one main difference, however, is that as a conservator, we don't have the artistic freedom or creativity that artists do. Um, one of our main aims is to return the painting to how the artist intended it. Therefore, we're never changing um, any of the composition or any of the stylistic elements within the painting. We're minimally treating it to try and return it to how the artist wanted it to look. Fantastic. So when they come to just view the painting on display, we're not going to see a small Miranda painted into one of the shapes. No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to make sure. Um, okay, another question that we had uh, it has to do with some of the equipment that you were using. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anyone who's watching made it in to see uh, Conservation in Action while it was running, but um, you would have seen them fastidiously working away with a large pair of, sort of glasses strapped yes. to their heads and um, the stick which Miranda has four pieces. <laughs> Can you explain a little bit about what the purpose of yes, these is? I've got, yeah, so I've brought my props with me. Um, but these first are what we call optivizers, and they are a method of magnification that you wear on your head and it enables me to magnify the area that I'm looking at whilst also keeping my hands free, meaning that, um, yeah, it's basically magnified and I can see it much more easily than I can with my normal eyes. And this um, thing that looks a bit like a wand is called a marl <laughs> stick, and it, um, I use it during retouching, and it's got a very soft chamois leather head, which gently leans against the painting, um, and it's important that it's very soft so it doesn't cause any damage to the painting. And I use this to rest my hand against, which in it steadies my hand and enables to be much, much more precise and delicate, particularly because when we're retouching, we never paint over original paint. All of our retouching is isolated to areas of loss and damage, so it's very important that we're very precise and have a very steady hand. Cool, thank you so much for that. Um, the next question that we had came through was about the materials of the painting itself. Um, I would imagine that the paints that were created uh, in 1670 are a bit different from the ones you would get from the sort of arts and crafts store today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the composition of those paints and how they're created then versus how they are now? Definitely. So during Van der Velde's time, they would have been making their paints themselves. So they would have used ground pigments, which they, they then would have mixed into an oil to create their paint. Now, these are very different to what we use as conservators when um, retouching. We, use, we try and use um, pigments as close as possible to those that um, the Van der Velders would have used, and that's important to ensure that our colour matching is as accurate as possible. Um, however, there are a number of uh, pigments that the Van der Velders use that are actually toxic, and so for health and safety reasons, we <laughs> don't use them nowadays. <laughs> So those would include pigments such as lead white and orpiment, which were both found in um, analysis of a royal visit to the fleet. So in those instances, we have to use um, modern substitutes that are not hazardous to health. Um, but the other main difference is that we use a synthetic resin as our binding medium rather than oil. And this is important because it enables us to differentiate between what is original to what is later applied. And we have a very um, jazzy trick where we can use a UV torch or a UV light source to um, shine on the painting and areas that I have retouched appear black under ultraviolet 
and the original paint doesn't, so it's very easy to see what is later applied and what is original. The other fantastic thing about our conservation paints is that for hundreds and hundreds of years' time, they'll remain reversible. So if another conservator comes along and decides they want to take the painting purely back to the original van der Velde, they can do that without damaging the painting at all. Great. Thank you so much for that. Uh, the last question that I have for you is, um, you've obviously put a lot of work into this painting, uh, as, as the whole paintings team. Yeah. Um, what's going to happen when you, you finish the retouching, we get the varnish on, what happens yeah. then? Um, so next, the painting will be reunited with its frame, which is also being worked on by our frame conservation department over in Kidbrook. And then it will be displayed in this very room in early 2023. That's great. Sorry, so but this isn't the only um, conservation project we have. It is not. So uh, we obviously have a lot of different objects from the Van Velders, the ones that they've been uh, involved with. Um, the next is that we're not going to talk about is the Solvay Tapestry, um, and it's been another monumental conservation effort <laughs> around that. Um, and yeah, we've got a little video that we're actually going to play. Um, we've not been able to undertake the conservation in house because of the nature of just how large the tapestry is and the special work that goes into it. So we have um, contracted us out to a studio in Brighton called Zenzi Tinker Studios. They have been absolutely fantastic in helping us bring the tapestry back to life. Um, and there's been a fantastic fundraising campaign around that, which I'll get into a little bit later in the show. But we now have a little bit of a video um, that was taken down in Zenzi's studio, just to give you a little behind the scenes peek of the tapestry itself and some of the work that's been going on. Because textiles are organic, the fibres are just not really built to last. Textiles are quite vulnerable to light damage and to handling damage, so they become quite weak structures. We do everything by hand, so we prepare the linen, do all our dyeing, and then we do all the stitching. As things naturally age and also may get repaired, that becomes part of the history of them. And a conservator isn't necessarily wanting to interfere with that. This tapestry is from a set known as the Soul Bay Tapestries. It's a really beautiful tapestry. When it arrived in the studio, we were all blown away by it and how worthwhile a project it is. It's around 350 years old, and it's a very large, weak textile. Its condition had got to such a point that the museum couldn't display it and it couldn't safely be hung, and it needs to be hung vertical to really appreciate the perspective in the design. It's about six metres wide and almost four metres tall, so one of the biggest challenges is just handling it. So we're always handling it when it's rolled because then the roller is supporting the weight. What we're doing is introducing a full support of linen behind the tapestry and then we work at structural and aesthetic stitching through these weak areas to principally reinforce the structure but also to give it aesthetic improvement and help bring back the design where it's become indistinct from damage. It's very slow, intensive work. Once we've framed the tapestry up, we don't see it again in its entirety for another 18 months. I think we feel a real connection with the weavers because we're working so closely and intimately in almost the same way that they wove the tapestry in the beginning, and that's a privilege, really. Welcome back to Van der Velde Live. I hope you enjoyed that last video. And to tell us a little bit more about the Sol Bay Tapestry, we have Mao. You've been very quiet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm sure on this topic alone, you cannot be quiet. <laughs> you, you really, you know, you've been in charge of uh, looking into the history of the tapestry. How exciting. So what does it show? And who was it made for? And why was it made for? Yes, wow, lots of questions. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of... What does it show? As the name suggests, it shows the Battle of Solvay. 
uh, which was fought between the English and Dutch fleets in 1672, May 1672. Um, our tapestry shows the decisive, kind of dramatic crescendo of the battle, really, um, and the defining loss for, for the English fleet. <laughs> um, it shows the burning of the Royal James, which was the flagship for the Earl of Sandwich. So in the tapestry, we see uh, the ship engulfed in flames, we see smoke kind of pouring across the field, um, and we see you know, members of the ship's company jumping into the water to get away from the fire. So yes, a very dramatic. Um, in terms of who was it made for, it was commissioned by Charles II. He commissioned the Van der Velders to draw up designs for the cartoons very large drawings that were probably the same size as the tapestries um, and from which the weavers kind of understood the design. Um, and the final question, which was... I've <laughs> 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 changed my... Pe- well, let me go... Uh-huh. Um, why was it made? Why was it made? Why? Fantastic. Yes, so, I mean, there's lots of different reasons. Tapestries had uh, a practical function as well as a, as a kind of luxurious art function in the 17th century, you know, keeping out drafts and uh, warming rooms in enormous castles. Um, but in terms of why Charles might have commissioned it, I think it's important to look at a series of tapestries that existed at the time, sadly lost today. They depicted the Armada and hung in the House of Lords for several hundred years. Um, and there is potentially a sense in which Charles is trying to rewrite the Battle of Sol Bay as his kind of defining success, his armada. Fantastic. Um, so the way that the tapestry was created seems to be quite, I mean, it's such a large object. Um, I was wondering if you could just go into a little bit more detail just about how one creates such a large <laughs> tapestry, because um, it seems like it must be quite a complicated process. Yes, so the first stage is, is definitely uh, working out the design for the tapestry um, or for the tapestry series. Um, as Imogen says, the Van der Velders had a, a rich archive of sketches from the battle, so they had drawings from the Battle of Sol Bay. Um, and they started to go through those to, to choose scenes to, to depict um, and then draw those up into enormous scale. The cartoons that were produced. Um, as I say, would have been the size of the tapestry, so so kind of four metres by six metres or near enough. Um, they would then have been sent to the tapestry workshop. Um, there are some questions about where the Solbay tapestries were woven. Um, kind of received wisdom tells us that that was at Mort Lake in uh, just along the Thames, actually. Uh, but kind of more recent um, research suggests that it was more likely in the city of London. Um, in terms of the process of weaving, they were woven by the Points brothers, or potentially Points father and son. Um, the cartoons may well have been cut up after production, which is, is a sad fact. Um, but that meant that they could be positioned next to or behind the loom, so that the weavers had the image to kind of weave directly from, um, yeah, to create the images that we have today. That's great. Um, so one thing I noticed when I first saw the Solvay tapestry um, is that uh, on top of the, the battle being depicted, which, which is amazing, um, is the borders and there's incredible symbolism kind of all around. Um, it's, it's really, really quite striking and some of it very odd. Um, so <laughs> I was wondering if you could just kind of go into some of the symbolism um, and what it means, yeah, how that translates. Yeah, so the borders um, are, as you say, very odd. They have lots of kind of maritime mythical creatures like mermaids and tritons and these kind of monstrous fish (laughs) Uh, and, you know, cherubim as well as um, dodgy looking mermaids uh, and dolphins. Um, But although that's true of our tapestry, it's not true of uh, the other tapestries which depict the Battle of Sol Bay um, that were designed by the Van der Velders, the second series, woven from the same cartoons, have very different borders. Um, They are armorial, they have flags, they have scientific instruments. So the first series with this kind of mythical sea um, presents the sea very much as a dangerous, you know, unknowable place. Um, But the second borders are, you know, we have conquered the sea, we can know it, but (laughs) via our scientific instruments. Um, and, you know, we're still trying to think about who made that decision. Yeah. Was that the Van der Velders? Was that Charles and, uh, and his brother James II? Was that 
the point is who wove it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think one thing that when people come to hopefully eventually see the tapestry once it's on display, um, one of my favourite bits is if you look really, really closely, there's a little guy in the sea who's holding onto a board, sort of Leonardo DiCaprio style, and he's been <laughs> blown up on the ship. You have to get yeah. quite close to sea, but yeah, you can have that when you, when you come have a look. There's going to be people who want to see this when it's done, but to make sure it gets done, what do you do? Call for help. Yeah. Miles, how can people so, help us? So currently um, we've got a fundraising campaign which has been led through Art Happens, which we'll put a link to in the comments. Um, we've been successful in the fundraising for the conservation of the tapestry, which is fantastic, but we're hoping to just get over the line to be able to display it in the Queen's House, and that is the last piece of the puzzle at the moment. So um, if you can donate to, to a great cause and to help bring this tapestry on display at the heart of Greenwich, um, please follow the link, and there's more information there. Now, this... Well, our Solvay Tapestry and Royal Museum's Great Solvay Tapestry isn't the only one. It's actually um, a series of tapestries, and our friends over at the National Maritime Museum in Netherlands have very kindly made a short little video to tell about what they've been up to over there. So, while we're watching this, please, when you come back, put some questions in because when we come back, we've got some more questions for you guys from you. So in the box just below me, I think, or there, <laughs> somewhere. Just type them in and we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, but I say please enjoy this video from our friends over in For dessert, I want to show you something special. It's two of the Sol Bay tapestries that are now, for the first time, on display. These are two of the Sol Bay tapestries. The series includes six tapestries made for the English king Charles II. Willem van der Velde the Elder was an eyewitness to the battle. It was his last battle where he sailed with the Dutch fleet before he moved to England. The Battle of Sol Bay between the English, the French and the Dutch was undecided. When van der Velde started working for the English king later that year, the first commission he got was to make a design for six tapestries depicting the Battle of Sol Bay. Van der Velde the Elder was happy to comply because he, of course, was a witness to this battle, but he had one little problem. He was on the Dutch side, not on the English side of the battle. This was something that could be remedied according to King Charles II, because his brother, James, the Duke of York, was the commander of the British fleet at Sol Bay. We can actually see the ship of the Duke of York right here with the royal standard. We can also see that the sails are already riddled with holes from cannonballs. This tapestry shows you the second day of the battle. A second day of the battle is an interesting thing, of course, because the Battle of Sol Bay only took one day. This is the morning after. The ships are in line of battle, but the battle itself never took place. The other tapestry shows you the day before, the day of the actual battle. And this is a very cataclysmic moment in time, where the Royal James, the flagship of the Blue Squadron of the English, is set alight by a fire ship from the Dutch. And we see the Royal James burning, and the English and the Dutch ship fighting the Battle of Sol Bay, and almost poetically they sail towards the horizon, and this is the end of the actual battle. Well, this really brings us to the end of the exhibition Willem van der Velde and Son. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you soon in the museum. Queen's House in the Van der Velde studio, and we are talking about all things Van der Velde. So, Miles, I think up next, shall we talk a little bit about the influence of the Van der Velde? Yeah, um, so I've got some questions for Imogen and Maya. Um, it seems like drawings played a really crucial role in the way that the Van der Velde has produced work. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the sort of drawing process and how that influenced what, what they made? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as you've seen from these um, little clips that we've been showing you, the Van der Velders produced paintings, they produced tapestries, 
they could produce both on commission quite easily because they had a huge backlog of drawings. We have uh, some 1,400 van der Velde drawings at Greenwich alone, and there are thousands more all over the world. This tells us that the studio must have overflowed with paper, <laughs> um, you know, spew, like all over the floor, we can imagine. Um, th these drawings are not just ship portraits, they are not just technical drawings. They are not just studies of battles. Um, some of these are offsets, so tracings made so that you can transfer one design from a, from a piece of paper to another piece of paper and then onto a canvas so that you can replicate the work that you're making. There are also um, a number of really interesting studies of different weather conditions. There are diagrams made to show studio assistants how light should fall um, across sails um, to talk about the different kind of weather conditions going on on the sea. All of these details suggest to us um, that drawings are really the bedrock of the Van der Velde's artistic practice and that they were used um, to expand production beyond just father and son um, to involve many other hands at work in the studio as well. Um, but as I say, these drawings are really varied and we, we get a sense um, from looking at a, a series of drawings of the process of the way they conceive of compositions and that is certainly the case in the Solvay Tapestry as, as Maya has already said. Yeah, I think for me one of the most interesting drawings or some of the most interesting drawings are the ones that show the Solvay Tapestry but from van der Velde's perspective within the <laughs> Dutch fleet um, and you know the ones depicting the Royal James you get a real sense of there's the Dutch ships and then the James in the, in the distance and yet our tapestry is completely reoriented <laughs> um, and we get this sense of him redrawing it to kind of slowly bring his perspective round. There's also a sense that he's working closely through drawing with his patrons. Mm -hmm. So um, there are very occasional notes from James II and Duke of York um, kind of suggesting different um, perspectives. So particularly in relation to the tapestry, bringing the perspective up from the usual kind of Van der Velian on the horizon to right up in the sky. Mm. I think there's something really compelling about the drawings, which are so clearly right on the water. They're, they're, as I said, I think at the beginning, you know, these drawings are often compiled of many different sheets of paper rolled up. You can imagine, and we, you know, there are images of self-portraits of Van der Velde in his little boat with these rolls of paper and um, drawing action as it happens from a very low perspective, really right there in the action. Um, and that is, I mean, it's just, it's incredible to see the way that he almost draws himself and paints himself um, into these battle scenes. Amazing. That's great to hear. Um, so next I wanted to touch on the sort of impact of Van der was coming to England at that time, sort of what that signified, um, and then also sort of the legacy that they left uh, on British art from that point on. Mm. Uh, it's a great question. So, I, I mean, for me, I think the Van der Velde's legacy here, their importance in their day, but also in the centuries afterwards, really can't be overstated. Um, we, we are perhaps less keen on marine painting at this point in time than we have been <laughs> in previous centuries. However, the Van der Velde's were hugely influential for all of the artists who came after them, and, and the most famous of them, of course, being uh, JMW Turner, who was himself a proud owner of van der Velde drawings. In fact, he said when he saw a, a print made after a van der Velde painting, so not even the painting itself, he said, this made me a painter. And, and many of his early works um, are inspired by the van der Velde's. He had a huge collection of van der Velde drawings um, and some of his um, most famous paintings um, are even conceived in response to Van der Velde painting. So, for example, the Bridgewater Sea Piece, today on loan to the National Gallery, that was painted as a pendant to a giant Van der Velde painting um, in the Bridgewater collection. Um, so I, I really think, uh, as I say, it, their, their impact on British art, therefore, cannot be uh, overstated either. If we think of Turner, we think of the ultimate marine painter in, in some respects, but really the Van der Velde's are your kind of proto turn as if you like. <laughs> Amazing. Brilliant. So we have our own exhibition plans for the Van der Velde. We've just seen what they've been up to over in Holland, uh, which is fantastic. But uh, we have a sneak peek. Can you tell us uh, what we have planned um, in the Queen's House? It's on the horizon. 
just for you, Matt, I will tell you <laughs> <laughs> what we have planned. Um, so 2023 will be a really special year for us here at the Queen's House. Um, it will be 350 years since the Vandervelders emigrated here. Um, these artistic emigres who transformed British culture really deserve a celebration here in the rooms where they worked at the Queen's House. Um, and we are absolutely thrilled that the results of our big conservation projects, Miranda's work on a royal visit to the fleet, Mayer's research on the Solvay Tapestry, um, that the, these works, um, newly conserved, newly researched, newly interpreted, will be on display here in the rooms where these works were conceived alongside hundreds of other treasures from our Van der Velde collections. We have one of the biggest collections of Van der Velde's in the world and many of these works so often in store will be out for everyone to see for the first time in decades. So see you there next year. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be really exciting and um, it's, I, we've got some questions here, so thank you for everyone sending the questions in tonight. I've got the first one, if that's all right. And so Michael asks... Here, Michael, whoever wants to answer <laughs> it. Um, yeah, not too much, but yeah. So Michael asks, do we know anything about what the Queen's House was like when the Van der Velders worked here? Did it look like where we are right now? We don't know exactly what it looked like um, it, then. Um, however, there are several paintings of the building at the time. We know it still had that vista down to the river, so useful for the Van der Velders, who were um, obsessed with drawing the scenes that were going on there on the Thames. You know, imagine giant ships moving up and down the Thames just in front of the Queen's house at the bottom of the lawn. Um, we know that the architectural transformations to the house had already taken place, so um, some of the, uh, the, the upstairs spaces had already been expanded by that point, which made it um, all the better for the van der Velders to use those rooms on the first floor um, as the space to draw up the designs for their tapestries. Um, and we think we know that the van der Velders had their studio here in this room that today we call the van der Velder studio. Um, there is documentary evidence that some shutters were added to um, rooms on the south side of the house. Um, these shutters are not those shutters. Um, <laughs> I'm pointing at shutters that you can't see, I'm afraid. Um, we have shutters here um, now. These are not the original van der Velder shutters. And, and yet that description, I think, is really evocative for us. We can, we can think about how the van der Velders would have painted in this space, how they would have needed lighting and how they would have needed sometimes to shut the light out for things that they well, were doing. Even tonight, getting ready for tonight's show, we were looking at the sun as it was setting coming through and it's quite so evocative being here and just going, wow, we are actually in this space and the sun going down around this time 350 years ago or so, it would have been amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, how, did, how did you feel, Miranda, when you were doing the retouching in this space? Because I know that, I mean, to just hear a little yeah. bit of, you know, taking that in the sense of having the painting back potentially in the room where it was painted, yeah. actually having a hand and, and bringing it back to life. Yeah, it was a very, very surreal and very special feeling to think that the last artist to have touched the painting with his paintbrush when the painting was in this room would have been very likely to be Van der Velde the Younger himself was an incredible feeling, particularly as, you know, I was the next one touching the painting in this setting. It, yeah, it was an incredible feeling. Definitely gave me goosebumps. <laughs> um, we've got another question that's come through from Sophie, um, which talks about um, when a painting is being conserved, um, how do you decide how much to add and when you've gone too far? I mean, can you talk about some of the ethical decisions in sort of retouching and, yeah. uh, and painting conservation? Definitely. Um, I mean, as I said before, we never paint over original paint. We're only ever retouching areas of loss or damage. So um, it's quite difficult to go too far in terms of painting over original paint. But um, it's not only the colour that we're trying to match when we're retouching. We're also trying to match the gloss, um, the level of the surface and the texture of the paint as well. And um, often that can be one thing that's quite difficult to match and you can tend to overwork that. But as I said before, it's very, great. It's very good that our um, materials that we use are reversible because it means you can just remove it, take it back to the original and start again. Fantastic. We've got one more? Shall We've got go? one more question, yeah. yeah. So, so we can fit in. Do paintings or tapestries need different treatments? And if they're being prepared for an exhibition, do displaying works mean greater risks? Ooh. I mean, yeah, I think that, <laughs> yeah. From, the, from just the, the different mediums, I think it, there's a massive, uh, massively different approach. Um, yeah. 
through some of the uh, trips that we've taken down to Zenzi Tinker Studio in Brighton, um, they uh, have a very meticulous way in which they approach it. So they, they sort of work on 20 centimeter, um, and I hope that I get this right so Zenzi doesn't, isn't <laughs> rolling her eyes as I say it, but um, yeah, they work on very small sections uh, at a time, and it's again, very meticulous work. Hundreds of hours goes into that, um, much like a painting, but in a very different way. Yeah. <laughs> yes, in terms of when it's um, on display, we're very lucky here that we've got brilliant conditions to um, display our works in. So luckily, nothing, really tends to get damaged when it's on display, but um, textiles in particular are very sensitive to light. So we have to um, display them in very low light levels, which is sometimes why our museum spaces look a bit gloomy, but it's definitely <laughs> for the um, protection of our objects. So um, there is always a bit of a risk when having an object on display, particularly textiles, but we do everything we can at the museum to make sure that they're protected while they're in our care. Brilliant. One thing I love about working here is the fact that all of us here are from different departments and we work as a team and it was, it's not just the museum that works, it's in the Vanderbilt as very much a team as well, it wasn't just family, it sounds really cheesy when I'm <laughs> but it was the fact that you work together, collaboration is huge and hopefully you've seen that tonight, that across the departments what we're trying to do, because this is your collection at the end of the day, hopefully you pay your taxes, hopefully, <laughs> um, but this is yours and um, but if you want to help out more, Miles, do you want yeah. to? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd just like to extend a massive thank you to, to everyone that's here that's contributed. Also, a massive thank you to Zendi Tinker Studios and all the conservators who are working on the tapestry. Thank you so much for all the work you've been putting in. Um, thank you to Miranda for working on the painting, to all the research that's been going in, to all the images and this incredible work um, towards the exhibition, which will be happening in 2023, and for all of Matt's work around all of the conservation projects we've been doing with all of the sort of school groups and everything that's happened. It's been a massive, like you say, team effort, and it's been amazing to be a part of. So thank you so much for that. Reflective of the Van der Velders. Also, the <laughs> ultimate collaborators, fathers, sons, grandchildren, and all. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the last to just touch on again, um, there'll be, it'll be in the comments, but please um, go to the Art Happens campaign. If you can contribute, just to get us the last play over the line to um, be able to display the Solvay Tapestry after the conservation is complete, please, please go, support us. Come see the Tapestry in 2023 if we can get that. We could hit that target of £30,000, it would be fantastic. Um, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. <laughs>